Right. There's a new version of FreeBSD being released. It's 13.2. And we're going to download some images and try them out. Right, we're going to download FreeBSD 13.2. Uh, just scroll down, there it is. There's a release notes if you want to see what's new. Uh, we're going to click on AMD64 and the Raspberry Pi ARM64 image. So we'll just click on that. It takes us to a, a, a plethora of uh, options, but we need the memory stick one, the AMD64 memory stick image. Let that just continue to download. And we click on the, uh, if I can find it, oh, that's, uh, you don't want the Raspberry Pi B, you want the RPI one. And again, there's a, <laughs> a wide choice. But we need to go down to, if I can find it, you don't need the ARCH64 one, although you think you would, but that's not the one you need. You need the one that specifically says RPI. There it is. It's an archive image. Um, so we'll need to extract it when we've finished downloading. And there it is. They're both going. Not the fastest internet in the world, so I'll just um, I'll leave them to do their own thing. And back on that page, and like I say, if you want to read the documentation while you're waiting for it to download, you've got the release notes, uh, the README, hardware compatibility list, installation instructions, uh, errors, and sign checksums if you want to check what you're downloading. Right, it's been downloaded, and I'm going to extract it to the memory stick. And, you know, you can use whatever method you want. I prefer to use uh, DD. You have to be careful using it to make sure you're pointing it to the right device to be written on. But in general, it's uh, DA0. So before we start uh, installation, let's have a look at what's new. Here's a very brief summary. You've got WireGuard. Kernel driver is now available. Open ZFS version 2.1.9. Open SSL version 1.1.1T. Open SSH is version 9.2 patch set 1. You got Beehive hypervisor supports guests of up to 16 virtual CPUs. ASLR is enabled by default for 64 bit executables. And snapshots on journaled UFS file system is now supported. And there's a whole plethora of uh, fixes and bug uh, squashes and other additions, which you can find out if you go to the release notes. Right, I've put the USB stick in my test machine and uh, rebooting with it in. And there's the specs if you are all interested. I'll just make sure it boots from USB. And there we go. I need to change my system uh, battery. It's uh, giving me error messages. And here are the usual menu. Things don't change in FreeBSD, really. And the menu is uh, pretty much as it always is. So we just wait for it to count down and wait for it to do its thing. Right, the FreeBSD installer. You can install. Go to Shell or Live CD. Uh, obviously, we're just going to choose install. And we go to the key map selection. And we need to just scroll down to UK, United Kingdom, because the default is US. We'll just select that one. We don't need to test it, but we'll just continue. And you choose a host name. Again, you can just put anything you want here. I usually put test. Um, we'll do unselect debugs. We don't need that. I'll leave everything. Yeah, I'll leave it just on lib32. You could put parts and source if you want, but I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll choose auto ZFS. Uh, you could choose UFS if you want, or manually do it if you wish. And it will go through, uh, Zroot is already taken, please enter a name, okay, well I'll just change the name of that. You could confirm it using the same name, but I'll, I'll change it to, uh, I don't know, Tank. There you go. Install, we need to choose uh, pull type or disks, and it says zero disks at the moment, so we just need to put Stripe, because we've got one single disk. Choose that one, and we'll leave the rest of things as default. I press proceed. Are you sure you want to carry on? Yes, we do. I will fast forward the uh, the install process. It doesn't take a long time, but we'll you know for the sake of the video. 
And there we go. So we need to choose a system password for root or the uh, admin. I'll just type that in. It doesn't give you any stars as input to let you know what you're typing. So you only need to be sure how many characters you've done. Select a network interface. Uh, IPv4, I don't need DHCP. Uh, put the manual inputs in there. Uh, set the time to Europe. Scroll down to UK. I say, if you've done FreeBSD before, you'll know all this. And set the time in the machine, because it needs to be fixed, because I haven't put a new battery in. And we're going to select services. Uh, we'll put mouse. NTP date, NTP D. I will select that. I think we're good to go. And you can choose the security options here if you wish. I'm just going to disable uh, a few. Again, if you're familiar with FreeBSD installation, then you know you know what to, to expect. I'm going to add some users. Without them, it'd be pretty uh, pretty much useless, wouldn't it? Oh, Robo Nuggy. Put the name. Press defaults for these. Wheel, operator, and video. Don't know why I put them in. It's uh, kind of like I do it every time. Choose shell. And defaults, defaults. I keep going, no, no, no. And password for your user, password again. And uh, we don't need to lock it out. And we're all right with that. Yes. Add another user, no, and there we go. Exit, we don't need to make any changes. And it's now finished, uh, we don't need to go manual, and we'll reboot and remove the USB stick. And that's pretty much it. Things don't change with FreeBSD really much, and uh, the installation method really is as it always is. It's fairly straightforward. It may not look the most user-friendly, but it's quite straightforward. Now I'm just rebooting with the new FreeBSD install. There we go. Need to log in. Password. There we go. And it is what it is. It's FreeBSD. We'll just have a look at the uname. There we go. Look, Free 13.2 release. All nice, new and shiny. And there's top for those who may be interested. Of course, we've just installed, so there's not really much running and it's not using much memory. But uh, that gives you an idea of what it's like straight out of the box. Right, okay. So I'm just going to go into root. And we're just going to bootstrap the PKG because we want to install a few things. Uh, do you want to fetch and install it? Yes. This pulls in the latest uh, package database. By default, um, it tracks the quarterly branch but not the latest, so you might want, if you want the more up-to-date packages, you might want to change that. But we'll uh, we'll see what it's got. Uh, 32,860 packages. Oh, that's, that's quite a few more than last time. Right, so we're going to install a desktop and uh, Xorg, etc. I'm going to put KDE, Firefox, and LibreOffice. You know, some of the, uh, the basic things you need for a, a desktop to get things done. So, there we go, so, two gigabytes to be downloaded. So I will let it get going and we'll fast forward to the end. Fantastic, that didn't take two seconds, did it? Now that that's done, I will alter some of the settings uh, that we need to do, config files, etc., and we'll get the desktop up and running. I'll link to a few videos I've done about FreeBSD desktop if you want to know the steps you need to do. Look at that, a nice brand new KDE desktop, nice and clean. It's got some uh, already KDE things installed. That's one of the benefits of KDE. It gives you a whole uh, whole drawer full of tools. And there's uh, Firefox, etc. And NVIDIA I've also installed as well. That works nicely. I'm a slightly older video card, but it works fine. Power Miser, yeah, that's working at maximum, so that's good. We'll just quit that. We'll just start Firefox up. It will give us a whole blurb of things, no doubt, because it's the first time we've used it on a new install. If it actually... Well, there we go. And, oh, look at that. Open up to an amazing internet. We'll skip that. 
And uh, skip that. Lightning fast setup. Okay, well, if you say so. Uh, you're helping us build. Well, that's brilliant. Start browsing. There we go. Lovely. Who says that FreeBSD can't be a good desktop solution? Brilliant. That worked very nice. Very happy with that. Right, next we're going to try a basic um, function of plugging in a USB stick and see what happens. I'm going to put the install media in and it's picked it up and mounted it. No, I haven't mounted it, but it's recognized it so you can manually mount it. And we're going to try a Windows formatted one. Let's see if, oh, there we go. And that one's fine. Yay, it's a video that I've done earlier, which will be coming out after this one. Very confusing. Okay, well, let's pass that test, so I'm quite impressed. And we'll just shut the computer down. Very good indeed. Right, the next test we've got is that we're going to install the ARM64 uh, image of FreeBSD 13.2. I'm going to put it on this external drive, this SSD, and it's uh, with a, like a uni cable. It's like a USB 3 cable, but it's got the power and the, uh, the connector at the other end, the SATA connector, all in one unit. So you really just plug it in. You don't need an external power thing. Not the fastest uh, SSD in the world, but it's one that I uh, use. And there's a Raspberry Pi. Now, I've got to apologize for the image. I've had to film on a uh, like an external camera looking at the screen because I couldn't get uh, my usual um, image capture thing to work. So uh, you can have to put it with this, unfortunately. So... The thing is, the installation is slightly different from the uh, the obviously the AMD sixty four version. In that one, you have to sort of like do the partition etc. yourself. And this one, it expands the image to fill um, what you're installing it on. So there is a slight there's, there's a few steps that are, are are missing. It practically does it itself. So once you boot up, it will go through the uh, the process. And there's a little bit of um, tweaking we can do after it's been installed. And, you know, you can't see what's going on. The The actual text is way too large. And that's, again, it's that's another tweak we can make later on to a config file. So it shouldn't take much longer, hopefully. Uh, mouse is now working, that's good. And hopefully, he says, it's uh, scrolling up a little bit. There we go. And I think it's done. We'll log in. Root uh, is the user, and password is root as well, so you, you want to change them, obviously. And we're just going to do a uname, and there we are. Right, so now we're going to do a little bit of configuring. And this is one where we can... Uh, it brings up familiar-looking uh, choices, but we this is one where you can tweak a few settings, like your uh, region and keyboard, etc. So I'm just going to choose UK for these. Time looks fine. Mouse we don't need to do, but we'll have a look. And we can change the host name. I'm going to leave it at uh, generic for this one. I can change it later. Network interfaces. It should pick up the Ethernet. Yeah, it has. There we go. And I'm just going to change these uh, settings. You can put whatever you want in this one. And like again, I apologise for the uh, the rather large uh, or the the amateurish looking screen capture. I couldn't get my uh, usual screen capture thingamabob to work, which is typical when you don't have to do a video. But uh, that's just one of those things. And we'll save it. Bring up the interface. Yep, and. Look at the default route, and I put that one in. Like I say, you might have to do all this yourself. It depends on yourself. Name server has been added automatically. Yep. And we'll just do this to bring it up again. Yeah. 
We'll have a look at wireless, and yeah, it doesn't detect the built-in Wi-Fi of the Raspberry Pi. And we'll exit out of that. Right, we'll just check that our internet is working. Yes, it is. Right, what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to shut down the Raspberry Pi. I'm going to unplug the uh, SSD. I'm going to plug it into a uh, the test machine that we've actually set up earlier because I need to change a config file. I know I could do it via this, but I'll I'll do it via the uh, the other one because it'll capture it better. We just need to alter a configuration file in the boot partition of the uh, Raspberry Pi image. And that will allow us to change the resolution. Otherwise, the text is going to be too big and it's going to look it's just not going to look right. So I plugged in the USB stick. The MS-DOS boot partition is what we need. We'll mount that. And we're looking for config.txt. Oh, sorry, a minute. There it is. We'll change this. Uh, there's, there's only one setting you really need to change at this point. You could put some overclocking later if you feel confident. But the one changing that we, we need to make now so the, the screen is more, you know, it's, it's, it's more readable. Well, it depends on your point of view, but it's more readable in tense, in the sense that you get more text on the screen, is we just need to change it. HDMI underscore safe equals zero. And we'll just save that. If I can find it, there it is. Maybe I need big text. And yeah, we'll just e if can eject it. There we go. Unplug that and plug it back into the Raspberry Pi. And then we'll reboot again with the new settings. So here it is. I'll just uh, plug it in. There we go. Hopefully. Yeah, the text is much smaller. And again, I've got to apologize for that. It, if before there was too much text for the screen for you to read it all, now there's too, it's too small so you can't read it. But trust me, it's going through the usual... Uh, it's booting now. It won't, it won't take as long as it did last time because it doesn't need to expand the image. And we're in there now. We need to add a user. And because it only gives you the root one by default, it doesn't give it the option to create a new one. But the, the process is the same as when I set the uh, the test machine up. I'll exit out of that. And we'll just log in with a new user. And, yeah. We'll scroll to the top, clean the screen. Now we're just going to root, put the password. And we're going to need to change the password because the default password is root, which is, uh, you, you want to change that. So we're going to change it to put in uh, one of your own choice. There we go. Put it in there again. All done. So just to test the new password. Yeah, that's fine. Now we're going to do as we did in the test machine. I'm going to package install some of it, but it will... I guess if I can remember what it's called, it's uh, not XFC4, is it? It's XFC. There we go. And it will bring in, if I scroll down to the bottom, you can't see it, but it'll bring in a, a fair amount. So we'll start that off, and we'll let that run, and uh, we'll see what happens. But before that, we need to edit the X in it RC, which I didn't show you on the test machine install, so I do apologize. It's the same thing. For this one, we need to start XFCE4 with CK launch. And it, I'm surprised it didn't pull it automatically, but we'll actually have to install uh, Exorg, the full Exorg. So we'll tie this one in. And to test it, when we're all finished, let's we'll start X. And there we go. It worked very nice, and it runs really well too. So I'm just going to go over to Simple Screen Recorder in the Raspberry Pi, so we get a better image. Yes, I know this looks different because I've added wallpaper and I've changed the uh, theming, but this is XFCE on the Raspberry Pi 400 uh, with Simple Screen Recorder going. There's a little bit of uh, overhead with that, but it's still very usable and actually um, really fast. And it's everything you want in XFCE, of course. Uh, we'll have a look at applications in a minute. And uh, there's the bottom 
menu with a few things that I've added in, like LibreOffice, etc. And icons there. And NFS, uh, as a client, I've uh, added that. So yeah, I think it works really snappily. It's um, it's a pleasant feel, which is a... I'm, gonna say, I'm not saying it wasn't before, but it seems a little bit quicker this time, which is a good thing. And of course, right-clicking gives you the uh, short menu there. With the applications at the bottom. You know, if you used XFCE, you know what to expect. You can either do the right menu there or the the full menu there. Yeah, I mean, everything just it feels a lot quicker than uh, previously. So I don't know what tweaks have been made. I think it's the uh, the uh, the optimization for the uh, AM64 is starting to pay dividends, I think. And there's the about, if you want to have a look. 3BST 13.2, and it's running on ARM Cortex. A72. Very nice. And there's your Abbey Word installed. I'm going to type hello. And we're going to try LibreOffice at the same time. See, see if the system can manage it. It's still very... I, you know, I'm quite impressed by this. It's still very, very snappy. Um, for a little Raspberry Pi going. There is a Raspberry Pi 400, but... Uh, It's got four gigabytes of RAM, I think. Was it eight? No, it's four, isn't it? Yeah. Four gigabytes of RAM. It runs quite fast. So let's have a look. We're going to put. Um, oh, I don't know. We're going to start Inkscape as well. Hopefully, it will. There we go. So yes, we've got the running now. We've got the uh, LibreOffice and Abbey Word and Inkscape, and it, it's, it's, there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of lagging going on, but it's not major. There's a little bit of lagging there. It's not too bad. And the realism is, is because we haven't um, FreeBC hasn't got the graphics uh, drivers going like, uh, say, for instance, Raspberry Pi OS does. So there's that little bit of delay, and it's done by software rather than hardware. Or it's not optimised. But it's good enough. And if you don't have the major things going on at the same time, then, uh, like for instance, a uh, simple screen recorder, which does, it's got a little bit of overhead going on there. Without that, it would be a lot smoother. So I'm just going to put HTOP in as well. And we'll see... What that looks like. There we go. In case you don't like top, this H top for uh, those more graphically orientated uh, viewers. Yeah, it's all right. I'm impressed with this as well. So, it was very good on the test machine and the uh, AMD sixty four image. It's running very, very well on the Raspberry Pi. So, so far, you know, I mean, it's it's looking good for 13.2. And there's the, uh, the disk layout, really, for those who are interested. Of course, I've mounted the um, NFS storage. You don't get that automatically, of course, which would be nice if that happened, if you detected it and mounted it. But it's, uh, you get temp, boot, dev, and root. By default. Very nice. Indeed. I'll just stop the recording. Now both the previous sections were about a new installation. This one is upgrading the main system. A little bit nervous about this. Nothing that ever has ever gone wrong, really, but, you know, it's kind of like you know, your main system. So I'm going to back up first. I'm going to use the uh, the boot manager. 
I'm going to make a snapshot. Let's take that name. Too lazy to write it out. I'm going to make a snapshot before I install and change things. Which is always recommended. Back up your information just in case and make a backup if you can. So it has. It's been made. So first we're going to do is we're going to update the system. See if there's any uh, packages that need to be updated. So once that's done, we do PKG upgrade as well. I know there will be because uh, some of these have been uh, tweaked and altered. So I'm just going to reinstall. And now we're to issue FreeBSD update fetch. So if there's any core system elements that need to be upgraded. You've got to remember that FreeBSD keeps it separate from the packages from the core system. So you have to upgrade two different uh, ways. And there's none available for that. So we need to issue the most important one, which is FreeBSD-update hyphen R. Means it tells people uh, a release. 13.2 hyphen release upgrade. So you can guess what that does. It means grab the latest upgrade and upgrade. <laughs> Who knew? It's not the fastest process in the world, and uh, you will probably uh, find that yourself. It looks reasonable. It will give you um, plenty of opportunities to change things before the system is fully upgraded, so you, you can have a working system. I'm going to fast forward a lot of this stuff because it really isn't the quickest. If you had source, it would even take longer, but, you know, we, luckily we haven't. The following file could not be merged automatically. Well, most of the time with this, uh, I'll just accept as it is. You might need to change things, of course, uh, but it's a lot easier. So we'll just uh, go from one to the other. More or less done. It says to install the download upgrade, and now we just need to run FreeBSD update install. So uh, you could type it in long form or just type it in the short form it makes no difference freebsd hyphen update install so we've fetched all the patches now we just have to install everything and now it says we're almost there it says kernel updates have been installed please reboot and run freebsd update again to finish installing updates cool so we'll just uh, reboot Right, we've rebooted. Let's go back into root again. And as it says, FreeBSD update install one more time. I'll fast forward it. Just take a while. Right, are we done? I think we might be. Just to check on the FreeBSD version we're running. Um, 13.2 release. Uh, Uname, of course. A release there. And we're going to check. We're going to uh, check on the OS release using cat. I'll give a bit more detail. Ah, see that still says 13.1 patch set seven. So I think we need to reboot, and it should change it. And we're back, and we've got to check again, and now it's a 13.2, which is good. So I think the system is fully updated and upgraded to 13.2. And that was actually uh, fairly straightforward. I've not noticed any problems yet, and I don't really expect there's going to be. Well, I mean, the thing is, I can't give it any other than five stars. So we've got improved ZFS, uh, which feels uh, snappier. I know, it's, I know it's not exactly uh, a scientific evaluation, but it does feel things seem to be a little bit quicker in that regard. You know, like files appear and move around, and it's just a little bit faster. Much improved performance on a Raspberry Pi is something which is always welcome and very noticeable too. I can put XFCE on the desktop on the Raspberry Pi 400, and it works flawlessly. I mean... That's brilliant. Thumbs up for that.
Uh, FreeBSD continues the tradition of stability and security uh, as an operating system. And if I do, if you do get any kind of crashes, it tends to be the applications or the the apps that crash. Yes, you know, for instance, like uh, you do get issues with Firefox on the Raspberry Pi being a little bit flaky. I found that it it does tend to um, it crashes quite a lot. You, I don't know why that is. Um, maybe I'm going to look into that. But everything else is. Uh, Super stable, but Firefox on on the Raspberry Pi, yeah, not so stable. Firefox on the uh, the test machine or on the desktop, super stable. So it's kind of like a little bit iffy that way. And but in general, FreeBSD itself is super secure and stable. Yeah. The install and upgrade process. I mean, from my point of view, uh, it may change for other people, of course, because you know you might not be familiar with FreeBSD, but is as easy and as uh, safe as always. I've never really had a problem with upgrading. I've never really had a problem with installation. And it may not be the most uh, aesthetically pleasing install screen or upgrade process, but it gets the job done. And to me, that's another plus for FreeBSD. It's not changed in, in any respects that way. I mean, you can go back to some of the earlier, very much earlier, uh, installs and it's the same so yeah it's it's it, it, that's one of the pluses for freebsd it doesn't change unless there is a need to change um the boot environment management which we used when uh, i upgraded the system the main system again invaluable and that's something which is a, a big credit to freebsd you can use the one that's um in with the base system or you can use one that you can download from ports on package they both do the same thing. One is slightly uh, user-friendlier than the other, with a lot more safeguards, and that's uh, BEADM. But whichever one you use, you can use that BECTL or Bechtel. <laughs> I always get people criticising me for the way I say things. Um, either one, you know, make a backup before you start any major upgrades, and you'll be, you'd be fine. You just roll back if it all goes wrong. And FreeBSD by nature, it will give you a blank canvas it'll just the base install and that's it you then it's up to you to uh install whatever you want on top so you could turn it to a server you can turn it to a desktop or whatever you want to do like I, i've made one or two videos where i think it would be a good idea either during the install or as an option to sort of like choose do you want to do a server in which case then you just install the bare minimum or perhaps give you options to install server you know tools etc or do you want to install a desktop, in which case then you go that way and you want to install uh, a nice desktop that starts up automatically. It's it's kind of, I mean, I, I would like it if they give you that choice. But as it is, FreeBSD, it gives you the base system, then it's up to you to install. And that in itself, that, that, that task can be a bit daunting to people, and I understand that. And sometimes you just want to get on with it, and that's why something like GhostBSD or NomadBSD would be an ideal solution. But it's... It's what it's a strength. It's both a strength and a weakness of FreeBSD. It's a strength in that sense. It, you've kind of got a um, you've you've got a blank canvas to do whatever you want, but it's a weakness because it will deter a lot of users who perhaps want to check it out. So it's kind of you don't. It, it's kind of like swings and roundabouts, really. There is a downside, of course, and this was most evident with the Raspberry Pi, because you had a Raspberry Pi image, and the hardware never changes in Raspberry Pi, so each person's Raspberry Pi 4 or 400, etc., are all the same. So there's no variables, no variations. I think if you're going to make an, a play for the uh, Raspberry Pi and other ARM machines, you, you perhaps need to get some of the basics working or make a concerted effort to get them working and in this case i'm talking about hdmi audio bluetooth and wi-fi now yes i know you could put in a, a workable bluetooth dongle hdmi audio can be gotten around if you put in a usb audio um, stick etc or if you use a supported wi-fi dongle but it it seems a shame even at this late stage of the game, you're still not supporting Wi-Fi in it. So really, and the HDMI audio is an issue on the main desktop anyway. It's, uh, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, HDMI audio, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, 
needs to be looked at. And that's the downside. I'm not going to knock off a, a score for that because it's something which is long running. And, and there's ways around. You know, like I say, you can, there's plenty of dongles, uh, workable solutions that you can just plug in. And you shouldn't have to, but you can do it. So once you put in a way to get your audio, Bluetooth, and Wi Fi, FreeBSD then doesn't have to be constrained by these um, issues. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a little bit something different. I didn't go into too much detail about how to configure things, really, because, um, you know, it would the video itself is long enough. It would go over well an hour, and maybe for another video. But anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.